And hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our roadmap for resuming elective surgery. Today is Thursday, April 23rd. My name is Carrie Lynn Box, and I'm the Senior Manager of Chapter and State Relations for AORN. All attendees have been muted. Your feedback is very important to us. During the town hall, please feel free to submit questions or comments in the chat box below. If we are unable to get to your questions before the end of the hour, we will post all questions and answers on our AORN.org forward slash COVID-19 support page. Please review the outcomes for this webinar listed here. A link will also be provided after the meeting to view and download the webinar if you are not able to stay with us for the entire session. One contact hour will be given for this session and evaluation instructions will be sent via email and posted on our COVID support page by tomorrow. I would now like to introduce our speakers, Linda Groh, AORN CEO and Executive Director, and Renee Battier, VP of Nursing. Linda? Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I want to cover, first of all, the background regarding how the joint statement was developed. We knew that we were in the first phase of COVID-19 and you were managing through the COVID crisis. Elective surgery had been canceled and staff was either being furloughed or being retrained to work in other areas of the hospital. But the real issue for the operating room was yet to occur. We knew that you were going to need assistance when you started to resume elective surgery after the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, as AORN's representative, contacted the American College of Surgeons, the Anesthesia Association, ASA, and the American Hospital Association. This is the group that similarly in most of our operating rooms are really responsible for that being that multidisciplinary committee that makes decisions and develops uh, guidelines and policies that run and we uh, run we run the operating rooms by or, or manage them. We needed to develop principles that we could a good that we could gain agreement on, so that we could uh, use those as a roadmap or a playbook for you at your facilities. The committee at each facility, of course, will be responsible for taking the principles and including other members of the surgical team as appropriate. So nurse nurse anesthetists, the uh, surgical technologists, those are all important players in, uh, in making the principles come to life and implementing. Dr. Gottlieb and his colleagues developed a document that FEMA and the White House were using as a roadmap to reopening the uh, whole idea of reopening the economy within the state. That document was released the day before our first meeting, and uh, Dr. David Hoyt from the American College of Surgeons sent it to all of the members of the task force. We used it as our guide. Now, we know that there are many issues that are rapidly evolving, and they all require very, uh, they require several different uh, opportunities to look at the principles. For example, almost every day there are new methods of testing that are being approved and research continues on the treatment plans for COVID-19. So these principles are exactly that. They are principles. And I, I really want you to gain an understanding that the overarching principle of this joint statement is the health and safety of patients and our healthcare workers. That is, has to be utmost importance as we move forward to moving into resuming surgery. Any resumption uh, in individual institutions needs to be authorized by, by the appropriate group. 
And in many states, we're finding that the governors or the state uh, health associations are the ones who are uh, having input into the state and county decisions. We did send us a copy of this joint statement to every governor across the country. So if you know of anyone in your state legislature uh, that you have a personal relationship with, please remind them that this statement has been developed and each facility should be using it to, and meet the expectations. It is important to remind them that priority is safety. That is absolutely one of the most important issues that uh, is a thread throughout this document. Our webinar this evening will discuss the why of the joint statement as well as the how. This impacts nursing as well as how you can assure patient and healthcare worker safety. We'll first talk about the timing for reopening of elective surgery. Our principle here is that there should be a sustained reduction in the rate of new COVID-19 cases. And this is within a geographic area for, and for at least 14 days. So whether it's within the state or whether it's in, within the city, that is the determining factor. And the second one is that the facility must have an appropriate number of intensive care units, beds, as well as non-ICU beds. Now, one of the things that I have found uh, yesterday at a conversation with uh, a director from Texas, and in that institution, they have decided that they must have at all times 25% of their beds must be available for COVID-19 patients. So 25% of the beds are set aside and must be available at all times. So if they use two of those beds for COVID patients, they have to find two more to augment that. So it's basically, they have set that as their goal. So every facility will, will need to do that. The of uh, avoiding the, the crisis standards of care is an important factor in that uh, you need to be able to take care of the standard patient that comes in. If it's a cardiac patient, you're gonna do surgery. Those need to be cared for without going into a crisis mode. Um, the, in terms of adequate staffing, that is of course very important is if the staff has been furloughed or been moved into another unit for, uh, to uh, provide care, they need to be returned to the operating room and they need to be used for caring for the surgical patient. The adequate staffing is absolutely essential, as well, of course, as the PPE and other equipment that would be important for care of um, the elective patients. The Part about the procedures uh, and the supplies, there has to be a sustained uh, supply list. In other words, if you're gonna be doing surgery for five days, then what do you need to start the next week? And you always need to be ahead of that. So you're not gonna get to the point on Monday morning where you don't have enough of your supplies to do surgery that day or the rest of the week. So this is a really an important part of this. It's a good time for you to reconnect with your vendors and your supply chain to determine the availability of supplies that they have available uh, within their warehouse or in their uh, stream and ask what, they, uh, what it looks like for the future so that you have an opportunity to partner with them and keep your supplies moving forward. Renee? How else is this being addressed in facilities? Thanks, Linda. And thanks again for your tremendous leadership in guiding the development of this document. And for all of us, as we work together to go down this really uncharted path. Some of the considerations should include whether you have any shortages already of ICU beds, PPE, ventilators, and medications and anesthetics, as well as all the other surgical supplies. This, of course, is different whether you're in a trauma facility, 
specialty hospital, ASC or academic medical center. And like Linda said, your state's position and your region's COVID-19 decline. So many different factors that play into this. Your assessment of these areas as a perioperative professional will really help determine readiness. If you've converted ORs to negative pressure or have PACU beds that have been converted to ICU needs, what's the time that you need to completely return those to normal state to be usable for an elective surgery volume? Linda mentioned staff. What staff do you have available? Are they still deployed elsewhere? Are they furloughed at home? Consider doing a survey to determine staff scheduling preferences and certainly their additional availability for additional hours, whether they're part-time. You might also have retired staff who are willing to come back uh, as long as they have some appropriate onboarding and orientation. As nurses, um, you can encourage a review of organizational policies around length of shift and overtime because there is a lot of desire to be increasing surgery hours. So we need to make sure that we're staying close in with all of those um, safety policies there. Do you have enough staff in the partner departments? Because we certainly don't operate carry out by ourselves. Sterile processing is going to be needing increased hours. What about housekeeping? Registration, radiology, all of those will need to have the adequate staff for increased volumes in our areas. And I would underscore what Linda mentioned is that we have to pay attention to where the crisis standard of care may have become normal. The goal is not to compromise our standard of care unless we are in crisis. And we certainly want to ensure elective surgical patients proceed with the highest standard of care they should expect. Next slide. On this side, we're looking at the testing that is required within a facility. This is really important that every facility discuss this and have agreement on it. I've talked to some facilities who have said that they don't have enough tests. So what does that mean? Uh, availability of tests and getting the results. We know that we have seen, this is an area we've seen some rapid changes in. Uh, we know that Abbott re released one that is available within 15 minutes. The results are available in 15 minutes. Uh, so this is something that is really important that, that you talk about within your facility. Uh, some facilities are saying that they're going to test every employee at the, uh, when they come back to work, and then they are going to set it up on a periodic uh, check. So once a week, once every two weeks, because we know that we can all be carriers. So that facility has just made that decision. The facility I talked to last night in Texas has made the decision that they're only going to test people that have symptoms, whether it's staff or whether it's patients. So that's how they're interpreting this and how they're going to um, implement it at their facility. So the availability for healthcare worker testing an agreement is very essential. I think that this needs to be a facility team decision. Now, one of the things that we have heard back since we published the, the joint uh, statement is there's a number of people who have a lot of fear. A lot of fear that these statements, these principles are not clear enough. But what, what's important is that this document gives you the power. It gives you as an OR nurse, as a surgical technologist, as a surgeon or anesthesiologist, we're all concerned about our safety, our patient safety, and our family safety, because you can take some of this home with you. So really, if you are not, if you do not feel safe, you need to verbalize that. You need to point to the joint statement that remember it was put together uh, principally because we wanted to give you the power to have that multidisciplinary team behind you. Renee, this is such a hot topic and concern for all hospital staff. What are you hearing? Well, this is like one of the hottest topics, and it seems like the information continues to change day by day, and it certainly is different access in different parts of the country. I saw that CMS is suggesting uh, putting 
non-COVID care zones to keep some separation in patient care areas could be a consideration for your facility. Not everybody has that kind of ability to segregate. And then as Linda mentioned, um, it's about which patients are you testing um, and your ability to test those patients. If you're going to treat all patients as potentially COVID-19 positive, that's gonna lengthen your turnover time as it implicates uh, the time it will take to clean in between cases. So that decreases the overall efficiency and volumes you'll be able to put through on your surgery schedule, as well as increasing that precious PPE usage. So you can see how these policies really underscore the ability to add volumes. It might be a reason to only consider having confirmed negative COVID-19 patients for elective surgery, but again, that needs to be a facility-based team decision. As Linda mentioned too, listen to what your patients are asking as you are calling them to discuss coming back for surgery. I think you'll get a good flavor of what are their fears and what are they needing for their sense of safety in returning for surgery. If they feel safe, they're more likely to come back for their elective surgeries and they may make some demands on us that we'll need to address as well. There should be a policy of when to test staff and at what intervals. Um, keeping staff safe will help not only retain staff and um, help them feel safe in adding to their hours, but it will also support others who may be wanting to return to work after time away. So some things to consider. Next slide. Personal protective equipment. This is probably one of the, the second hottest issue <laughs> is all about the personal protective equipment. We have been lulled into a sense of using personal protective equipment in, uh, in ways that we would not in normal circumstances approve of. And this is important that as you look at your personal protective equipment, you look at it and assess it according to non-crisis level evidence-based standards. In other words, when you look at your inventory, you're not only looking at what you need currently available for your staff and patients, but also assessing the potential next wave. One of the things that COVID-19 caught us in the middle of was not being prepared. And not being prepared meant that we didn't have any backup supplies uh, to really use in a crisis like this. So every operating room should have a backup that you know is included in your inventory so that it is on a rotating basis, but that you always have, if you get the call in 24 to 48 hours that you have another crisis in your city that you have to go back into the COVID-19 crisis mode that you've got what you need for that uh, personal protective equipment. At the same time, this is also a time to retrain staff. They've been uh, accustomed now for a period of time to coming in in the morning, getting one uh, N95 and keeping it for the whole, whole day using a one, one gown, in iso an isolation gown for the whole day, that is not appropriate use. And so the staff training and retraining is really important and emphasizing that this is all about their safety. So the policies for conservation and reuse need to go back to what is appropriate for that evidence-based uh, guidance using the uh, the guidance that we've given, been given through CDC and, FD, and the FDA. The nursing team at ARN has been collaborating with Amy, APEC, the CDC, and FDA. So, Renee, can you expand on, on these recommendations? Absolutely. As many of you have been in on the clinical town halls or watched those videos, you are well aware of how hard the nursing team here at headquarters has been working on this to coordinate what our best options are. I think one of the hottest topics has been the N95, and there is a lot of resources in the FAQs about 
the how to use N95s and the re-sterilization that has had some emergency use approvals. We have shared some of that in our clinical town hall and AORN's Dr. Aaron Kyle will also be presenting on N95 and other PPE decontamination, the role of regulatory agencies in a health emergency during, she'll be doing that during virtual expo. So please be looking for that for additional details. Remember your current stock of PPE is key information for planning for this elective surgery uh, addition as well. And there is a burn rate calculator, I believe it's in the CDC resources that we've got addressed on our toolkit, but it's a great tool for, under these circumstances, we'll be using it uh, this fast and being able to predict and manage what your usage needs are gonna be, because the world is different now. Strategies for managing current usage. Some of you have told us you have a PPE czar or someone from Periop who is actually in charge of managing a lot of those supplies sent. Surgery is where there is a high usage already and a familiarity with those supplies. And again, as Linda mentioned, making sure that we are back to using it to non-crisis standards in the return for elective surgery is really key to be watching. Our supply chain partners are a huge partner for us here to plan for those needed supplies and understand um, what the chain is in being able to continuously have the necessary supplies. As now we need to be watching for a potential second wave of COVID-19 at some point. This might be quite a change from our previous patterns of just-in-time deliveries and low PAR levels. So we will absolutely need to coordinate this with our supply chain partners. Elective surgeries will mean a return of other partners in our areas, such as medical device experts, contracted vendors, and so forth. So it's really important for the multidisciplinary leadership team to identify, identify excuse me, clearly who is needed for what procedures so you can plan the appropriate PPE and needs um, for those cases, as well as providing a plan, as Linda mentioned, for educating all those folks who may not have been in periop during this time uh, of crisis. So they will need to have that education and do their practicing and validation uh, before their services are required during the procedure. Next slide, please. Case prioritization and scheduling. I think every OR manager director that uh, has been in, in this uh, business for any length of time at all, this is our uh, the one that keeps us up at night, yeah, probably every day other than when we're in the middle of a crisis. But you will be looking at what is the current caseload, the current backlog. Now, we know that there are some patients who are going to say, I've decided not to have that surgery. I'm going to wait another six months. So validation of what is in that uh, backlog is really important. And then developing a method of prioritization. Now, in the document, we actually give you a, a couple of references that are uh, reliable and valid for looking at that prioritization. Uh, the available time and allocations. Now, the, we've heard all kinds of, I would call them horror stories, like we're going to start doing surgery seven days a week. Well, not unless you've got the appropriate staffing. And we know that, uh, for example, truck drivers can't be uh, on the road more than 10 hours. So why do we think that we should have our OR staff, our surgeons or anesthesiologists in an operating room more than 10 hours a day? There is a high incidence of increase of medication errors, of patient injury, and the fatigue that the staff feels. I've begun to hear from time to time some, uh, some of the staff who are beginning already to feel that PTSD issues. So identifying who are the essential team members, and you'll see on this slide it does include the reps, uh, medical device representatives, how many of them and when and who and how and what training do they need, as, as uh, Renee just mentioned in the previous slide? And then what is the strategy for the phased opening of the operating rooms? 
There are some facilities that are indicating that they're going to start with outpatient surgery because that's where the caseload um, can easily be done without the concern for uh, bed utilization. What's important there is you need to make sure you have the appropriate competent staff to do those cases. So if there isn't the, uh, competencies and they're not experienced in doing the cases, then you have the, the power to keep those patients safe and say, we can't do that in this OR because we don't have competent staff. I don't have anyone trained to do a total hip, for example. This is an area that I think, Renee, you're an experienced periop leader. Uh, what would you recommend to our listeners? Thanks, Linda. In, in many ways, it's no different than managing a busy block schedule, but this is with certainly a lot of other challenges and a lot of pressure, both from patients who are anxiously waiting for procedures, as well as the financial issues that surgery represents to hospitals. So that multidisciplinary team really becomes important. Some places are identifying a subset of that group to be an OR scheduling team to specifically dive into this. So obviously, you've got to know how many cases are in the backlog, how long have they been in the queue. The ACS document uh, is titled MENTS, but it's short for Medically Necessary Time-Sensitive Procedures, has a great method of scoring the, these types of cases for a priority, which will be really helpful so that there aren't fights over who gets to go first. There are some specialties, perhaps cancer, cardiovascular transplants that might naturally fall to a higher level first. So determining what percentage of your cases those might represent, if any, at your facility. Identify how much available time you have for performing elective cases, and that's gonna be a combination of um, not only how many rooms do you have, but the how many staff you can have either for longer days or more days and is key to knowing how much are we even talking about as a potential. The matching of clinical skills has to be absolutely matched to which group is gonna go first. Factor in turnaround times based on whether those are going to be non-COVID or presumed COVID approaches, as that certainly makes a difference in your volume. And what capacity goal are you trying to achieve in the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? And that type of data will help in creating the model that predicts your needs. We are going to have a webinar on the CARE Syntax Predictive Model, our partner with Syntegrity, on May 7th. So please watch for registration. This will be a very useful tool for you in doing this predictive scheduling. Other things I've heard about that might be helpful are giving, do you give priority to surgeons who have a high volume or perhaps a high volume of a particular type of case, like joints are an easy, uh, an easy uh, example of that, but perhaps it's a high volume hernia surgeon or a high volume um, hysterectomy surgeon. And those are examples of ways to at least maximize the skill and the available time for most efficient. Some places are talking about rewarding surgeons who have taken the most call shifts, um, which can be a different approach. And then of course, what percentage of your elective cases should be outpatient if you're needing to protect inpatient beds? Um, if you're an ASC that has been closed, what extra duties and time is gonna be needed to open the facility by, with checking all the equipment, checking sterility, et cetera. Next slide, please. We spent a lot of time on the five phases of surgical care because we really wanted to give some direction, some guidelines around this principle because this is an area that may have some change in your, in your facility. You need to think differently than what, than what you've been doing, perhaps your preoperative your preoperative uh, assessment. You may need to uh, reformat it. You may need to look at other options. And one of the things that is really important here is that you uh, make, make sure that you maintain the consistency and meet the guidelines for 
CMS and Joint Commission in, re, in the requirement for their uh, timing of the reassessment as well as the lab testing and things. So that, that's a really important part of this. Um, thinking about how you can do remote education is also important. Many, uh, many specialties like orthopedics will have classes. Uh, do you need to have those classes done differently? We know that YouTube is being used in a lot of different ways. Could you put uh, directions uh, for the total joint in, on YouTube? If you do classes, you're going to have to maintain the physical distance or, or the social distance. And that may change. We know we have already seen some change in when what people are suggesting. No more than 10 people and, and that six foot uh, distance. So, Renee, what would you like to add to this? I would say if you haven't already moved to virtual or phone-based pre-op screening, this is absolutely a prime time to do so. My last facility had a very large centralized pre-op function for many facilities, and um, that's, this is the right time to do that. Of course, working with your anesthesia partners to identify additional preoperative data that may be needed in this new world such as if the patient has had COVID-19 already. All the H&Ps that have been waiting to go will need to be updated. Um, so looking at what can be done virtually ahead of time, I am hearing some places are using a specific provider uh, either ahead of time or day of surgery to update H&Ps to facilitate this process or some other element of tele telehealth ahead of time. Certainly identifying lab tests and imaging that will need to be updated and um, any additional education needs. I think patients are gonna have a lot more questions, so being ready with that as well as, as Linda mentioned, any group classes like joint classes, how else could you deliver those? You may also want to coordinate with your registration department to ask whether there's uh, any insurance needs that might need to be readdressed because we certainly are hearing about many people that have lost jobs and may now be without coverage. So having a well coordinated process with your financial assistance department uh, on being able to help facilitate that for patients would be wise. And certainly if post discharge needs are gonna point at a nursing home, this is high risk and that needs to be addressed early for the appropriate planning that needs to happen. Next slide. So the next area is that immediate preoperative area. We had an extensive discussion about the testing that may have been done prior to the cases being uh, canceled because of, of uh, the guideline about not doing any elective surgery. The decision was that that was something that needed to be looked at and most likely would need to be looked at by each specialty or each procedure. We know that the cost of re repeating uh, some of the testing is very expensive and does add to the cost, but it was important that they be looked at because there may be uh, changes in the patient's condition. The other area that uh, we had a lot of discussion on, uh, as you might guess, is the surgical checklist. Uh, we talked about should there be revision uh, that is completed and agreed on by nursing, anesthesia, and surgery with that checklist uh, in terms of considering COVID-19 issues. Renee, what revisions are occurring at facilities in regard to the checklist? Are you aware? I'm hearing adding in things like last test status, um, current patient concerns, even COVID history, if somebody has already had a COVID-related illness. And I wouldn't be surprised as we're learning more about some of the risk factors for um, COVID if that starts to play into it. But again, multidisciplinary team in adding in what's felt to be the key elements based on what your current testing policy is. Um, facilitating anything day of surgery that might not have been able to be caught ahead of time, depending on how your pre-op process um, prior to day of surgery is being done. And then 
just reinforcing for patients that they understand your visitor policies around those who are accompanying them and that uh, that's not a surprise day of surgery. Next so slide. the next slide is really uh, talks about the interoperative phase. And this is really important in terms of who should be present during intubation and extubation. If you do not have a testing policy that all patients are tested, and we know that they could test negative today, but positive tomorrow. But if you don't have such a, a policy, then you would assume uh, probably that every patient is a potential. So there needs to be guideline uh, present. There, who should be there during intubation and extubation? A number of facilities have, uh, are using and have planned to use the uh, plexiglass, sort of the plexiglass uh, cover that goes over the face while they are intubating a patient so that if there is any expulsion, it is caught by that plexiglass. Also, who, what, who, who should be wearing PPE equipment during this time? And what is it? Is everybody in the room N95 or is it just the anesthesiologist? There, that has come up on a number of occasions that uh, in some instances, in some facilities, that anesthesia is getting the PPE uh, of the N95 and the staff are not. Again, that needs to be discussed and everybody agree at the facility. And then, of course, um, this may be a guideline that you already have as to who should be in the operating room during a surgical procedure, but please take the opportunity to reassess that and make sure that everybody knows exactly what the expectation is and what, uh, what is the, what's the practice if somebody wants to bring someone who is not a, uh, on the list into the OR? What kind of guidelines, what kind of approval practice is there uh, included? Renee? Well, this is an area where certainly our perioperative expertise definitely takes the lead in guiding safe practice. So there needs to be a very strong and active perioperative nursing voice in creating the workflows depending on what your organization has decided in terms of testing and identification of COVID positive patients, and then how you are addressing aerosol generating procedures. Uh, are you keeping a negative pressure room for intubations and extubations? Are you using a separate room for this part of the procedure and moving the patient? Depending on how this process is managed, you'll need to have a consistent protocol for who is present, as Linda mentioned, during this very high risk element of the surgical process. Um, coordinating with your leadership team and determining those workflows guides, obviously not only safety, but the PPE usage and the planning needed for scheduling. Um, returning any rooms and spaces to pre-COVID usage, whether it's the negative pressure rooms or PACU beds that might have been for ICU, um, will require careful focus on the engineering and facility guideline institute requirements for safety. Returning any equipment, particularly anesthesia machines, will take careful attention to infection prevention standards as well, and we have those in our guidelines for, for you to go by. Your multidisciplinary leadership team needs to carefully identify who's necessary in the room, as, we, as Linda mentioned. Um, that's not only for safety, but just usage of PPE. Um, and then consider that you've got surgeons, vendors, students, and others who may not have been around much in frontline care during the COVID-19 crisis phase, and now they're coming back in. So that absolutely needs to be an important focus of education and confirming that. Um, and again, any increase in volumes have to have the appropriate uh, level of staffing from other departments, whether it's EVS, pathology, radiology, all of our partners. Um, and they may need, if they are staffing up, they may need additional education and training as well. Um, to help with some of those patient workflows, and uh, Karen Decay is going to be presenting the process flow for COVID-19 patients in the perioperative setting at the virtual expo. And I think that will be um, additional help that you can tap into to guide your work. Um, Terry Link, uh, our 
ASC expert will be providing a virtual expo topic on infection prevention in ASCs. So the risk assessment outbreak investigations will focus on ASCs and how they can be working on this as well. Good resources. Next slide. In this area, in this phase, we're focusing on the post-op. And of course, the patient going into PACU, um, making sure that standardized protocols are followed. And also, if there's any um, if there's any protocols that are already in place, the ERAS, that those be implemented and move forward. Renee? Yeah, I think, again, depending on how you're handling uh, extubation, it will have an impact on PACU. Uh, and of course, returning those areas to the pre-COVID status. Um, really planning the impact on PACU beds and staffing may indicate a really different type of staffing need depending on how you're addressing that and needs to be addressed carefully because the PACU workflow is an important part of throughput and um, including them in the increased volumes and how the patients flow through there um, will keep it from becoming a barrier or resource constraint for throughput. Um, it's also an area where the facility's policy on social distancing might impact how you are physically placing patients since quite often PACU areas are open bed units. Um, so it might be worth having a, a, a conversation, sorry, with your anesthesia partners to see how many patients could be fast tracked to phase two as the anesthetic needs allow and minimize the usage of PACU for phase one. Next slide. The next area is the post-discharge care planning. And this area, although you absolutely always start the discharge planning in the pre-op uh, phase, it becomes very important in this post-discharge because you want to return as many patients as you can back to their homes. Uh, we know that there's a high incidence of COVID-19 in many of the nursing homes, but what's really important is that the patients be able to go back to their homes as soon as possible. So what's available in the, in the city, in the facility, within the facility or within the city that, uh, where you're doing, where you are located? Because that may be a stop measure for doing surgery. So post-discharge care planning is an important part of the whole of the five phases and should be considered at the beginning of the cycle. Renee, do you have anything to add on this one? No, I think you covered that nicely, Linda. Thanks. So the next area is the importance of the collection and management of data. This is important because every day that you're doing surgery, there should be a huddle that occurs to see at the beginning of the day to reevaluate, reassess what worked yesterday, what didn't work, and look at what's going on with COVID-19 patients in your facility. Uh, looking at the resources that you need, any other teaching or, I mean, any other testing or, or and or teaching that needs to be uh, occur with the with the um, staff. Again, looking at where are we at? Are we ready to, if we need to have a relapse into COVID-19 crisis, do we have available beds? Do we have PPE? And do we have ventilator availability? So that is really an important part. And this is all part of the quality of care metrics that that needs to occur at the facility every single day and if you are an ambulatory surgery center you would do the same uh, routine and have the same rigor with which you would look at what happened yesterday and and what are some of the issues that we need to be aware of and or change in our practice today renee anything else you'd like to add yeah, I think I would underscore if if we are ramping up elective volumes, we've got more outside people coming in to the facility. So really making sure that the policy is clear uh, in, for everyone in the non-restricted areas of the facility and how that will be handled, including lounges, cafeterias, waiting rooms, et cetera, and clearly having visitor policies communicated. 
Um, and then having that be consistent in your pre-op communication and what the surgeon's offices are communicating ahead of time as well, websites, signage, et cetera. Um, I see that the CDC has some great patient communication signage and resources, so you might tap into that. And then, as Linda said, the ongoing and regular collection of the COVID data for your organization is not just crisis standard, but it's, it's ongoing and needs to be shared as we reintroduce elective surgery into the organization, because it's about planning resources and being right on the pulse of if things are changing. New cases, ICU beds, intubations, healthcare worker positives, all of those are really important for continuing to monitor this very quickly changing situation. Um, and then quality of care metrics, while not new for us, but the surgical safety quality measures like near misses, retained objects, and injuries, all are especially important now as we have potentially distracted, stressed, and fatigued staff. So really watching that uh, as we reintroduce more volumes back in to um, really stay on top of that. Next slide. So this final uh, area, or one of the final ones, is related to the safety and risk mitigation surrounding the second wave. We must always be on guard for the second wave. It includes looking at the current local and national recommendations for social distancing or physical distancing, as some people are calling it. It includes the number of visitors that should be allowed to come to the, uh, to the hospital with their, with, the, with their loved one that's going to have surgery. These are all very important uh, parts. And whether you have been on the front line or you've been furloughed home, the stress and fear of the un unknown, we know, has taken a toll. It's taken a toll on every one of us. It's important to have the support services resources available for all employees and tools for managing and improving the resilience. You've heard me say that uh, OR nurses are absolutely the most resilient group that I know. They take care of patients today and some of them with very devastating outcomes and come back tomorrow and assure that every single one of their patients are being cared for at a very high level. Our website has some great resources to help with this. The Psychiatric Nurses Association, for instance, has a stress checklist. The American Holistic Nurses have some great stress management tools that we've posted. ANA has many resources as well. But worker safety, as well as patient safety, monitoring and supporting your well-being is so very important. And certainly, it's important for your family. You need to develop clear messaging and support for the worries about bringing any risk home to your loved ones, as well as the patient who may be concerned about their family members. Um, there are some things that you can look at here. There are many people who suggest showering before you, you go home. Uh, do you have adequate scrubs for the increased usage that you may have? When you get home, do you take a shower right away? Those are things that all fit together in the risk mitigation surrounding and preventing the second wave, all important factors. There are some additional COVID-19 resources that we put at the end of the document that were things that we didn't really fit, could not fit quite into the principles, but number one, healthcare worker well-being, that post-traumatic stress that, that people are beginning to talk about. And it may be that the first week you're back doing surgery, it may be very prevalent. You may see an increase in absenteeism. How long, deciding how long you're gonna let people work and how many hours, and that all goes into that case, um, a resumption of the case hours. Where do, where do students and trainees uh, fit into all of this? Do they fit in? And how are you um, covering the family concerns? Patient messaging and communication is very, very important. A 
Again, I want to emphasize that rather than addressing specific professional roles, the roadmap addresses the timing for resuming elective surgery as one of the eight principles and the consideration to guide the physicians, nurses, and facility leadership as you resume elective surgery. We believe that the joint statement and the recommendations within the roadmap represent the needs of all members of the surgical team to enable clear decision-making as well as an opportunity for extensive collaboration among the team at each facility or within your city, sharing how you are handling things um, that are important to you in your facility. Before we move on, I'd like to ask for your help. AORN wants to support you as you move forward in providing surgical care and resuming your surgical uh, schedule. Please answer this poll to give us your feedback on your educational priorities at this time. Thank you for helping us with that. I, on this slide, I'm going to identify some additional resources that you have available to you. Um, the dedicated web page, the clinical consult line, the um, OR nurse link, COVID-19, which is members only, but that is available to our members. And I also want to remind you that on May 1st, we will have the virtual expo opening. Uh, at this, at, during that expo, you'll be able to get, hear some of the great speakers that you missed at expo. You'll get CEs as well as be able to stop by and visit with some of the uh, exhibitors. We've got a lot planned there. Um, there'll be uh, in-booth education. There's a virtual OR innovation suite, a sponsor's hub, and there's even a quest game where you can earn points for prizes. Uh, there's going to be a, a expo chat room where you'll be able to share your challenges and get ideas for practice with OR nurses from around the world. And maybe you'll come up with some new ideas on how you can resolve those. It has been our pleasure to offer you these uh, insights into this document. We know that there are some questions that have come forward. We will certainly make uh, every opportunity and take the opportunity to answer those for you. And I wanna thank you for coming and please stay safe and well. Thank you.